three days of exams. Day one, you would have a long case discussion in the community setting. Where you have to diagnose, you have to do a community diagnosis and you have to figure out what are the exact issues they're facing and you have to recommend, do recommendations, talk about different health programs that you need to suggest to the family. So, um, so we don't read ARC per se. the research thesis conferences and other, and how are the examinations so can you please walk us through this whole uh, journey of the main committee sure. so the md is i mean it's a dual recognition community and family medicine most uh, institutes of national importance offer it uh, i'm not sure now there's a separate family medicine but back then they were uh, awarding both so we are in that uh, those batches which were allowing both now the duration is three years it's not different it's not an additional six years or anything now, coming to the family medicine aspect, there's seven months of clinical postings in various departments. You will be the resident there. You'll work mainly in the outpatients, maybe medicine, endocrinology, dermatology, ENT, ophthalmology, uh, general surgery, OBG. Again, you'll have labor room postings, emergency medicine, trauma surgery. So that those anyway, there will be um, rotations and duties as such. That is about seven months. The remaining parts would be of community medicine. We had a yellow fever vaccination center where we used to handle. We had a family medicine OPD itself, which we used to uh, independently take care of, where it would be like the you know primary care kind of uh, OPD. If any patient comes with common complaints, they used to come to us. We used to uh, treat them, and then if required, we would refer them. Then we would be having the rural and urban outreach centers where we would be the medical officers there. Then we would also have undergraduate teaching, field visits, and uh, various trainings that we used to do. Uh, there's a common uh, uh, term that we use. It's called five-star physician. Five-star physician, we use it for community medicine physicians. Five-star meaning first is clinical care. You have to give good clinical care in your whatever setting you're in. Second would be training. You have to be training all your ASHA workers, ANMs, um, um, you know, your nursing staff, uh, the staff, community workers. Third would be research. You have to do a lot of research, epidemiological studies as such. So that's part of what you need to learn. Fourth would be education. You have to educate your community, uh, be it for the different health days or common issues. You have to educate them. Fifth would be you have to take care of the community health itself, like maybe doing outbreak investigations, kind of doing assessment of how good the facilities are performing, evaluations and things like that. So these are the core things that usually come in. Then along with that, uh, research again, you have to do community-based studies, not a hospital-based one. So I did mine in community-based uh, setting in a school where we assessed mental health status and things like that. So those kind of opportunities are very good. Uh, I personally, I enjoy going outside and talking to people, figuring out what uh, what makes them tick, things like that. And it's very fun. You uh, you learn the local language. So I'm from Bangalore. I knew a little bit Hindi, but when I went there to, I was uh, in Rishikesh, right? So uh, they were quite surprised with my Hindi and we used to have a lot of discussions. It was quite fun. So that was about the research aspects of it. Thesis, again, uh, you would have it at the end of uh, uh, your uh, fifth semester. Then conferences, we had to submit, we had to present it in two conferences. Papers also, we had to publish a minimum of two. Final exams, there are four papers, one for family medicine, two for community medicine, four would be a paper on recent advances, in both community as well as family medicine. Uh, all in all, this is the usual kind of uh, um, syllabus and coursework that we had. Yeah. And sir, how about examinations in your MD? How was it? Yeah, examinations. So we used to have a, um, it used to be um, a week long exam for theory. So four papers were divided alternate days. Practical was three days for, I think it's one of the longest ones. Uh, like each of us, there were only a three of us in the final exam. So there were three days of exams. So day one you would have uh, a long case discussion in the community setting where you have to diagnose, you have to do a community diagnosis and you have to figure out what are the exact issues they're facing and you have to recommend do recommendations talk about different health programs that you need to uh, suggest to the family so that would be the long case short case again we would have it in the hospital of aims itself 
So that would be more so in the family medicine setting. Uh, where we would be given a certain diagnosis of, uh, say, SAM, severe acute malnutrition, in the in the hospital setting. So it's about how you will diagnose what are the other issues that the child could face, immunization status, um, what about the educational level of the parents, and uh, other again health programs that you'd like to refer to them, and uh, tuberculosis case within the hospital, a case admitted for dengue. So the common cases again, it would be like a clinical setting. So again, the family medicine aspect comes in. Then we would have exercises in biostatistics, epidemiology, uh, micro teaching. So we would we are also learn to teach. So that's also part of what we do. Then we have a public health lab where we kind of uh, know how to check for water quality levels, iodine levels in salt, uh, hardness of water, things like that. I think uh, that's also a very interesting thing. And then there is also entomology, uh, that is uh, insects and other vector-borne diseases. Uh, so these were a core uh, few topics that we had to go through. All in all, it's quite comprehensive, I would say. Um, some topics are uh, very much relevant in today's uh, environment. Yeah. Uh, you have mentioned, sir, like a uh, whole detail. Uh, about all the opportunities. Uh, this looks like a glamour, but sometimes it might be also challenging uh, when you have too much thing to handle. So how like, how did you tackle this during your residency? Okay. So I would say um, there is a lot of information I agree. So honestly, during... Um, so we don't read Park per se, because Park is a good book, at least for the UG level. I know it has its fair share of uh, haters <laughs> because of how dry sometimes it may be. But uh, we had a different set of books, one for epidemiology, one for biostatistics, one for health programs itself, one for management, one for family medicine. So we have another textbook called Rackle for family medicine. It's like a Harrison level kind of book, only for family medicine. So I would say um, I used to uh, try and used to teach students, right? So I had to come prepared. So I think most of our reading, we did it because we wanted to be well prepared for the classes. So think of it in the mindset that you want to help the patient or you want to teach it to somebody. That way you have to be way well prepared. You cannot afford to, you know, be substandard. I think that extrinsic motivation kind of helped me stay focused on what I needed to read. Uh, rather than, oh, I have to pass the exam. Exams will come and go. But, uh, you know, having a patient or a student say, are you sure you know what you're doing? <laughs> that's, that's a very painful thing for any doctor for that matter. So uh, trying to uh, be well prepared, it's always good. So I think that's how I kind of manage. And, uh, you know, it's not always with the books, books. Read some, uh, you know, see some YouTube videos. Uh, now, uh, there are so many things, man. I personally, you know, uh, to my residency, I didn't use a physical book. I had a par textbook or just for, uh, you know, teaching students. Sometimes you have to read from there uh, just to explain a few terms. I had all my textbooks on my laptop. And I used to annotate, I used to cross-refer, I used to search online because you get latest advances, right? The book is stays, uh, uh, you know, stationary. Now you have to look at latest advances, cross-refer, discuss with people and really, you know, uh, talk to your teachers and everything. Talk to your uh, colleagues in other departments. Sometimes, uh, you know, OBG, uh, some, there may be a new way of, uh, uh, you know, management of anemia. What is the latest algorithm? I last I used to ask my OPG colleagues. Pediatrics, uh, I asked them what do they do for SAM. So things like that. I mean, the more you discuss, you can't just be reading. Residency is not just about reading. Reading, anyways, you have to do. That is no doubt. But retention occurs only when you discuss and you go, um, you go all in. That's the only <laughs> thing I would say. Yeah. Uh, you have put in that very well. So, sir, uh, this was about the residency. Now we're discussing about the career options available after uh, entering community medicine mm -hmm. in India. So, can you mention what are the different career options? Sure. I'll go in India first. So, most classically, they go into medical colleges. You do an SRship. Then you go into academic position, faculty position, EDP, and so on and so forth. So, that's a medical college aspect of it. That is standard. You will do research. You will do teaching, things like that. Second would be research institutes, where it may be ICMR institutions, uh, wherein you can apply for a scientist position. 
Now, recently, the results came out. Uh, one of my colleagues also got in as a scientist B. So it goes from B, C, D, all up the way up till G. So that's also a permanent position. So you will work at different ICMI institutions. There's one for uh, nutrition. There's one for epidemiology. There's one for HIV. There's one for TB. You name it, almost there's an ICMI institute available. So depending on your research area of interest, you can go in there. Or if immediately that position is not available, you can still go in for a project scientist position, which I did. Uh, at ICMR NIE, where I was a project scientist for, uh, uh, I mean, consultant epidemiologist for ICMR Center for Outbreak Science. So that was kind of what we can do. Next is international organizations, like you said. Uh, so there are many contractual uh, positions at immediately after you finish your MD. So WHO, they have something called as a um, surveillance medical officer. So right now they're kind of withdrawing it because of the whole WHO, USA withdrawing from it and things like that. But positions still are open in some places of UP and Bihar, where you will be managing an entire district, ensuring that uh, you know surveillance of all vaccine preventable diseases and other things. UNICEF also has some project positions, BMGF, Bill Melinda Gates Foundation. These organizations, again, they're all temporary positions initially, but if you prove your worth and if they really find you that you're doing a good job, then they'll take you on board as a long-time consultant, and then you can take it back. Then some of them, they go in for further studies. So US, UK, Europe also have very good public health institutions. Some of them are, are like Johns Hopkins, London School of Hygiene, Karolinska Institution. There are, there are many courses that are there relevant to what your interest area is. Thing with public health, right? My main thing is you have to figure out what you're really interested in. Uh, if you are a little bit, you know, kind of inclined towards a certain area, go for it then do some more additional degrees or work in that sector. Then you will be recognized for the work you do in that. And then you build a thing for yourself. So that's kind of how it works. Then clinical care with family medicine also, you can have your own setup. And then you can also do as your own clinical setup. And uh, many corporates also have a family medicine department that uh, you can work with. So it's basically like you do a lot of health screening and things like that. So then you can also do research if your organization picks up. Then there are many pharma companies that want to do clinical trials. So they'll hire a proper research coordinator who's good in research methods. So usually pharmacology department or community medicine are the ones that get into these. They also uh, have good opportunities there that you can really grow in. NGO, again, some more NGOs are there which are well compensated. They pay well. So again, if there's something that really touches your heart, you want to work, that's also very good. So NGOs really like people who are doctors and know about the communities like their weight is in gold. And now NGOs are very well connected, trust me. They, you may think NGO, what is there? I want to go to WHO. Trust me, an NGO, if it's well established, and if it's there on your CV, right, people will be like, wow, you have done such big work. That kind of shows your character. People overseas, they judge a little bit on your personality more than just your accolades. You get top, or top rank, all India rank 10, 20, whatever. But uh, again, if you want to get into those colleges, they look at, okay, you have this research experience, you have NGO experience. That really adds so much value. And uh, freelance work also, many of them, they kind of uh, research consultancies, uh, data analytics and things like that. And then I kind of made it a proper entrepreneurial business venture where we kind of help with research and all. So that's also something uh, that you can really look forward to doing. Yeah. So, so we will be deep diving into CV and freelancing in later segment again. So mm -hmm. uh, in this segment, what are the job of a family medicine physician look like and how does it, yeah, how is it different from community medicine? 